As we move closer to the 2024 NFL Draft, we look at a few different mock draft scenarios this week on the Wandering Buffalo Podcast. You're now listening to the Wandering Buffalo Podcast with your host, Justin Goddard. Bills Mafia, welcome into another episode of the Wandering Buffalo Podcast, a show on the Buffalo Fan Base Podcast Network. My name is Justin, and I will be your host today. And fun episode today. If you listen to this show, you know that a couple weeks ago, um, I had done a mock draft episode. Uh, we had it all finished, ready to publish, all that. Um, and not even a full day later, um, the news is announced of the Stefan Diggs trade. Um, so pretty much everything in that draft. Um, I mean, it, it wasn't completely thrown away. There's still some ideas that I like there. There was still um, a pretty serious need for wide receiver. And now it's kind of just amplified. Um, so obviously, you know, changed a lot of the draft strategies, all the things of that nature. Um, just throwing the disclaimer out there at the beginning of the show, I am in no way, shape or form a uh, college expert, a draft expert, anything like that. Um, I do consume a ton of content about the draft. Uh, I follow a ton of people smarter than me. Um, kind of let me let them point me in several different directions because everybody has different opinions. Um, and I use that kind of a little bit of a baseline towards um, directions that I'm headed uh, when I'm looking at things. Um, also, as much fun as we can have with drafts, I don't intend on any of these to be really predictive or anything of that nature. Uh, the draft gets wild. There's going to be, you know, selections that are tremendous reaches and players that fall, and there's going to be teams that do weird things that nobody would really predict. Um, so it's kind of, as we're moving through this, it's kind of just... More of just a thought exercise on, you know, seeing where where talent drops off. Um, for example, I think the edge rusher is uh, a huge need for the Bills, um, not just for this year, but going forward. Um, I mean, right now you have Greg Rousseau. He's coming up on a contract being due. Uh, we have Von Miller. He took a pretty big bet on himself for this season, but who knows what he looks like. And then AJ Epinesa obviously brought back, and we've seen a lot of growth from AJ Epinesa, especially throughout this past season. Um, how ready is he to take on a bigger role, and and what does that look like? Um, so I think that's a huge need. Obviously, we've made some moves at safety, but losing, you know, a couple of cornerstone pieces that were on this defense, um, in. Jordan Poyer and Micah Hyde. You look at the loss of a guy like Trey White. Um, talked about it in the past on this show about, you know, we've all but, you know, not had Trey White on the team for the past two, three seasons. Um, but just losing that, that body, that number, and seeing how riddled we've been um, in the cornerback room on defense. Could we add a corner? Um, so just kind of playing through where some of these players are going, when we see runs on um, certain position groups. Um, so I'm going to run through three scenarios today, um, each of them kind of having their their different merit, I guess. Um, I'm only going through a couple rounds, maybe a third round, if you know a, a trade comes up that we're able to get a, a third round pick in there. Um, but I want to look at the scenario of trading up way up for a receiver, um, the stick and pick, and a trade down scenario. Um, the trade up is going to be the one that I do first, um, and that's getting way up into the top 10. Um, I actually already have that draft loaded up, so you didn't have to watch me fiddle around with what compensation was. I maybe could have tried a, a little bit more to, you know, finagle if it was, you know, 
two fours and a three or something like that instead of a second, whatever. Um, kind of just went through this scenario to just kind of look at what the cost is of getting up there. And, and this is one of the things with mock drafts is, you know, we're not the GMs on the phone that have to accept this offer. Um, I can offer up all the picks I want for the 2025 draft and not have to deal with the repercussions of it. Um, you know, the, how the board falls on these drafts is a bit of randomness to it, but also it's going to be different for every mock draft based on, you know, what kind of big board they use, how they see each team's needs, um, all that. So like I said, these aren't meant to be predictive at all. Um, they're just kind of a, a thought exercise and seeing how different scenarios play out. So the first one I have here is going to be looking at the trade-up scenario. And as I did this, it kind of already did the first couple picks here. Um, but I was able to trade up to nine with Chicago. Um, cost a ton. And I was able to do it. So, so I kind of did this one putting more in the eggs of the basket of the future me problems. Um, but it was our 28th pick this year. Um, first, second, and third round next year. Maybe maybe this, maybe both the second rounders. Um, not positive. But just kind of looking at it from that cost perspective, um, this is probably my least favorite scenario. And to be very clear, if we're on draft night and I see the Bills move into the top 10 and they're taking one of these, you know, blue chip receivers. I'll get on board with that real quick and I'll think about the cost of it, you know, when we get to next off season and we're, you know, working with limited resources. Um, but for me, this is kind of just, I was listening to Locked on Bills with Joe Marino. He had Chris Trapasso on, um, his most recent episode, just kind of talking about where the bills are and all that. And, and it's a sentiment that I've kind of had myself in. Go ahead and listen to the episode. Chris Trapasso says it much better than I um, ever will. But just kind of looking at this off season and where the bills are headed. It seems like Bean has kept the unit together. You know, kind of pushed the chips in on all these these players that we've had, um, and we weren't able to get over the hump. And this off season has been kind of, let's take some medicine on money, let's reset things. I think Diggs got added into the mix early due to you know other circumstances that we may or may not ever hear about. Um, but I think that time just came to its end, and. I think he would, the intention was for him to be around one more year, you know, swallow some of his money next year. But things changed, obviously, and here we are. Um, so my issue with this strategy for the draft is the amount that you're giving up for, you know, a non-quarterback pick and looking at how many positions that we're trying to reset and be able to reset money on it even if we get into the top 10 to take a receiver, um, I think before the Diggs trade happened, we already had a need at receiver um, with Gabe Davis walking. And yes, we brought in Curtis Samuel, but with Diggs on the roster, I still wanted a receiver draft pick to kind of slot in for Gabe Davis, maybe year one. Curtis Samuel would kind of, help bridge that gap, but looking for the the heir to the Stefan Diggs role. So now, not only do I still want to select that that player, but I think there's a need for two receivers in the draft now. Um, and the way I see this kind of building out is I see my take on it would be Bean's philosophy being more of like... Um, kind of a trend we've been seeing in the NFL where teams are willing to ship off, you know, these 
these top alpha receivers and kind of build out the room with like three or four receivers that are, you know, like a 1B or a 2A type receiver um, and just kind of having talent all, all around the field. And this is a trend that I could see continuing in the NFL. Um, not that these, you know, blue chip guys aren't going to be taken, but when you look at some of these contracts that are coming up, these receivers are going to start getting, you know, 30 plus million dollars a year. And on, you know, if, if you're on a team that has the franchise quarterback that you have to pay, um, now you have to pay, you know, your alpha top receiver. You're talking, you know, $80 million in cap space tied up between two players um, with the cap right now sitting like 250 I know it's going to go up, but you're you're still talking a third quarter of the salary cap tied up in two guys when you still have to field 50 more players on the roster. Um, so I, I think these blue chip guys kind of make more sense if you have that quarterback on a rookie deal or you kind of have a middle of the road quarterback that's not going to get huge money. Um, I think with how many positions we're resetting on this roster, um, talked earlier about our, our need at defensive end. Um, well, that becomes even bigger next year. I just think that this is, while it would be super fun, um, just not a great use of resources um, looking at what team needs will be going forward. Um, so like I said, this kind of started the draft before I got a chance to pause it when I was working that trade in there. Um, the first thing we see here when I talk about you know mock drafts being kind of wild and random is... Um, Offensive tackle going second to Washington, not a quarterback. Um, that's something that I don't see happening in the actual draft. Um, but also, if it did happen, we're still going to get these quarterback picks in here. Um, somebody's going to move up for a quarterback. All those things that happen, um, this only stands to kind of push talent down the board, uh, which might make a guy like, Brian Thomas Jr. accessible in, you know, like the late teens. And um, if we start getting in a scenario where we're talking about trading up to, you know, the late teens, early 20s, and the the cost to come up is, is a bit different, um, fully different conversation I'm willing to have. Um, but the, the getting into the top 10 not something that I would be doing if I was um, taking the reins. We got Malik Neighbors, Marvin Harrison Jr. going there. And this draft for me is already cooked from the start, um, just with the idea that um, the plan was to get into the top 10 for one of the big three, hoping for Roma Dunze. Um, Obviously, this kind of plays out differently in a real draft scenario um, where you wouldn't necessarily, you know, fully commit to that trading up prospect um, unless the prospect is there. Um, so this is going to be a scenario where I would just go ahead and take Brian Thomas Jr. Um, might try to run through this scenario again just because I've I've never... I've done this scenario quite a few times and I've never really seen it play out with um, tackles going before the quarterbacks, whatever. Um, if this was a scenario where we had traded up, I, I would be looking to trade down right away um, and get into the 20s here, uh, but kind of a risk that, that you take. So Brian Thomas Jr. will be the pick here. And while we're kind of going through the picks here, I'll also say that as much as I think wide receiver is a huge need on this team, I think positions in this draft, particularly um, the edge position, once you kind of get out of the first round, there's a huge drop-off in talent. Um, and I think as much as it might 
heinous. I have mentally prepared myself for the possibility of Edge being the first round pick here. When you have a wide receiver draft that's as deep as this one, there's tons of options. There's tons of players that could fit. Um, It would just be a scenario where I wouldn't at all be surprised if a position like edge where the talent's going to drop off like crazy is where the Bills brass decides to go with the first pick. Um, and just just looking at this from from a, a logistical standpoint of, you know, how many receivers are left that I would still be happy with. Um, Malachi Corley, Ricky Pearsall, uh, Jalen McMillan, Tez Walker, who um, the Bills have brought in, done several visits with. Um, Jermaine Burton, who's a really interesting player who's got some off-the-field stuff going on. Not sure that he would be on the Bills board. Um, but Ricky Pearsall's a guy that I really like. So that would be somebody that I would be comfortable with taking in the second round um, if we didn't go with the receiver in the first round. Um, but just kind of looking at where we end up with the edge group after that, um, no names really popping out that would interest me in in the second round. Uh, Marshawn Neeland is somebody that's kind of been jumping up. Um, defensive tackle, I think, is also a big need for us. Um, Chris Jenkins, Braden Fisk sitting there. Um probably be about the direction that I would go. Um, I think we do have the defensive tackle position shirt up for this year. Um, but very similar to to the edge group. What do we look like in the future? Um kind of we just brought back Daquan Jones, we brought in Austin Johnson. Um that's a one year deal and then the depth just isn't there again. Um, So I'm going to make Chris Jenkins the pick here. And just overall, I come away from, from this scenario feeling, just feeling like we gave up too much for how many receivers are here that I would be comfortable with. And, I'd feel a little bit better about it if everything played out the way I wanted to and we had Roma Dunze on the roster. Um, But kind of the way these shake out and just kind of going to let this wrap up and move into the next one. And this would be my stick and pick draft and just kind of have these going on random orders to see, you know, who goes where, all that. Um, but you know, no tackle to Washington here pushes some players down the board. And then all of a sudden Roma Dunze is there till 12 naturally. (laughs) Um, but again, that'd be a situation draft night where, you know, Bean is watching each pick happen and, um, is able to make whatever moves he wants, um, for the sake of having the trade already done. Kind of screwed me there, but here we are. Um, And now we're sitting here at 28, and Brian Thomas Jr. has fallen right into the Bills' lap, Um, which obviously seems like a no-brainer pick, but I said, just kind of exploring um, possibilities that exist here. And with this, I'm looking at how many receivers here I would be comfortable with taking and then kind of thinking about a combination of two receivers. Um, So looking at it from a first round perspective, Brian Thomas Jr. is an easy pick. I don't want to just sit here and keep picking the same players either. Um, And we saw in the last scenario that there was plenty of receivers Uh, as we move through the draft that I would have been comfortable with. Um, So for me, I would start looking at 
please don't kill me for this. Um, this is just kind of where I look at the the Bills brass going. We we've, we've heard um, Bean talk so much about how he likes to build through the trenches, and if he's going to overpay, it's going to be in the trenches. Um, none of these defensive ends popping up here are somebody that. I'd be really all that interested in taking in the first round. Um, there are some defensive tackles that I really like sitting here, though. Uh, we already talked about Chris Jenkins in the last draft in the second round. Um, but right at the top here, we have Johnny Newton, Byron Murphy, and those are two dudes that I think if they make it to if they make it to pick twenty eight. It, it's almost like you got to take one of those guys, um, especially with with the way the interior is shaking out on the defensive line. Really hard to uh, leave Brian Thomas on the board there. But like I said, plenty of receivers I like. I'm going to make the pick Johnny Newton here, and we're going to take a look at receiver in the second round. Uh, Brian Thomas goes right after us. Keon Coleman to um, the Chiefs, which... As far as receivers in this draft go, I wouldn't absolutely hate. Um, Xavier Leggett going to Carolina. Um, developed a huge draft draft crush on him. Uh, if he was the pick at 28, I, I wouldn't be mad at all there. Um, but just kind of looking through some other players that go. Ricky Pearsall's gone. And... We're going to ignore the trade for now and just go right to the receiver because I don't want to wait on this for too long. Um, and this draft kind of shook out a little bit differently. So um, not as many names on the board here as there were in the last one, um, but still some great names. Roman Wilson, Jalen McMillan, Tez Walker, uh, Johnny Wilson, Jermaine Burton. I mean, just looking at how deep this class goes. Javon Baker is a player that I love and we're using the Pro Football Network simulator here. They have him all the way down at you know projected 144. I, I don't see that as very likely. Um, but I'm going to make the pick Roman Wilson here from Michigan. Um, I believe I saw that he had been brought in for uh, a pre-draft visit with the Bills. Um, so it's one that's kind of checking some boxes. The The Bills do um, pretty frequently compared to other teams um, actually draft players that they bring up for visits. Um, you could do a whole show on how much stock to put into that. Some teams use it as just smoke screens, some are trying to get more information. Um, but getting into the third scenario here, this is going to be... I plan on it being the one that I trade back. We're going to see how this board is going and go from there. Um, this one's got Odunze going 7. Um, Malik Neighbors going 9 to the to Chicago. Um one of the players I'm really interested in seeing what happens on draft night is Leatu Latu. Um, I could see a world where he starts slipping down to um, the 28 range, and that's all going to depend on his medicals. I think he's a player that I would like to roll the dice on if he could be healthy. Um, so there's Quite a few, all three of these trades are trades I'd be super comfortable with. Um, down to 37 and picking up pick 69 for 28 and 204. Um, with the Rams, pick 52 and 83. And future second and sixth round pick with the Rams. A um, little bit farther than I want to go, but that's. That's a deal that I would definitely consider if I was being and I had been able to add another 2025 second round pick and very easily, you know, start moving back up in the second, third round. Uh, I think that'd be a great, 
trade on draft night. Um, and then 43 and 74 with a future second from Atlanta. Um, here becomes the issue, though. Um, Jared Verse, edge out of Florida State, is somebody that I absolutely do not think should be sitting there at 28 and uh, going to have a really hard time moving away from that. Um, wide receivers, um, kind of more to pick from here compared to the last draft. And you see A.D. Mitchell at the top, Keon Coleman, uh, McConkey, Troy Franklin, who the Bills have seemed interested in, the draft crush of mine, Xavier Leggett. Uh, I'm still going to explore this trade down scenario just because of how many players are there that I'd be comfortable with. Um, trading away from Jared Burst is, is really challenging now. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and trade back with the Chargers here. Pick 37 is a range that I'm comfortable with with how many players are there that I like. Um, we don't get the future considerations. Those are trades that I would probably do if I was getting, you know, going crazy with trades here and moving all over the board. Um, trying to keep it fairly simple here. Um, so we're going to go ahead and just accept this one. Again, this is for the sake of the exercise. If Jared Verse somehow makes it to 28, you sprint to the podium. You don't think twice about it. Um, and then we all write because we didn't get a first-round receiver. Uh, for me in this scenario, though, I, I think it's super important to be able to get a third-round pick in this draft. Um, a very top-heavy draft with tons of talent, so I... I want the Bills to be able to get as many cracks in the top 100 as possible. Um, and if you had, you know, some some future ammunition to be able to use for that, um, I think that's great. And sitting right there is Xavier Leggett. I know there's a couple guys, you know, on the board higher than him, depending on whose board you're using here. Like I said... Leggett is somebody that I'm falling in love with. He's a raw prospect, but I think the ceiling is super high on him, which kind of checks out for a lot of Brandon Bean's draft strategies that we've seen. How many players um, have we seen the Bills take that are just kind of super toolsy and we bet on the upside? And you think about a guy like Josh Allen, um, Tremaine Edmonds, um, Dawson Knox, uh, Spencer Brown. The list kind of goes on and on about Greg Russo was kind of one of those guys. Um, so this right here is an easy pick for me. There's a lot of players that I like sitting there, um, but I think Leggett is kind of the, the bet on traits swing for the fences guy, and I think there's almost like no ceiling on what he could become. Um, so I'm super psyched about that pick. Like I had said previously, if the Bills took him at 28, I would be okay with that. Um, so getting him a little bit further down, able to add another pick, um, something that I would be really excited about. Um, and then for this second pick, Sitting at 69, I'm doing the double dip on receiver. Um, I'm going to take a look at everything, but right at the top there, there's receivers I'm excited about. Um, you know, Chris Jenkins is still sitting there now that I'm thinking that I took uh, defensive line in the first round, but we did trade down. Um, and I do think defensive tackle is that huge need. Um, I've already taken Chris Jenkins, so for for the for the sake of the exercise of looking at different players that I that I would be comfortable with, I'm going to do Braden Fisk here. I know I just said I'm taking receiver, uh, but when we look at that and 
see all of the talent at receiver still here. I want to come away from this draft with two receivers, um, but we're kind of going all the way down here. Javon Baker, Taj Washington, um, just still a ton of talent there um, that I think we could come back around and get another one. Um, so we're going to go with Braden Fisk as the pick here. And assure up that defensive tackle room going forward. And now we still have our third round pick coming up um, that we used in the trade down. We're not even going to consider another trade here. Um, we're going to come right back to the receivers and still kind of want to take a look here. Between those picks, only one more receiver goes. Um, so we still get kind of the the pick of the litter here and for me that's Ricky Pearsall um pretty easy pick right there and this scenario here um is the one that I play out the most frequently uh, I think it's the one that I would be most on board with um this one was really hard I've never done a draft where Jared versus sitting there at 28. Um, and that makes it much more challenging. Um, I kind of had these scenarios already played out on how I wanted to go through each one of them. Um, so like I said, it that's not a player that I would leave on the board. Um, but wanted to make sure that I got a trade down scenario in there. Um the little bit of time left to work with here. So I'm going to do one more just live right now. Um, and just kind of see, we're going to do it as a little bit of a slower draft and just see kind of where the board is going. Um, I'm not going to look to trade into the top 10 here. That's like I said, it's going to be, it's going to be more than what I want to give up. Um, if we see one of those receivers kind of start sliding, maybe we take another look at it. Um, Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors going back to back at 3 4. Uh, so, this is another draft where we're not getting quite the run on quarterbacks as I would expect early. Um, we're only at pick five, but like I said, those the the need for teams to get their quarterback if they don't have them is just going to push all the other talent down the board um quarterbacks get drafted higher than they should all the time just because this is a league where if you don't have the quarterback you're kind of spinning your wheels um we're just going through here Jaden Daniels makes it to 11 with Minnesota Jared Verse going 14 I don't know how he made it to 28 on the last draft, that's pretty wild. Brian Thomas Jr. going at 21 to the Chargers. Um, that's a situation where on actual draft night, if the Bills are, you know, giving up what it takes to get up to 21, um, that's a situation where we're no longer talking, you know, two firsts and change. Um it's a situation where I'm a lot more comfortable kind of seeing how it plays out. And we're coming up on the Bills pick here. We're going to look at the board first and then kind of explore the... the we'll look at the trade options. Uh, 43 and 74 with a 2025 second from Atlanta. Um, that one was offered last time as well. Um, pick 33 with the addition of a 2025 third. That's really not great return as far as I'm concerned. I, I would like a little bit more if that was this year's third. Be very interested in that. Um, and then Pittsburgh's pick 51 and a two and a four next year. Um, so not really setting up great for a trade back scenario. I might play with Carolinas there. They're only taking us back to pick 33, um, which is not bad. We're going to 
propose a trade to Carolina there and kind of follow that through. And they wanted to go to 28. And I would like pick 65 this year. And we swap out our third rounder for next year. And that has been rejected. I'll try one more here. This is uh, not the most exciting part of the draft, which is why the trade-up scenario, I had already done it. We'll exchange our third next year and see if we sprinkle in 128 if that'll get it done. And that's not going to do it. So Kool-Aid McKinstry sitting there um, is intriguing to me. Uh, again, that's a position where I think Bill's Mafia will right if we take a corner cornerback at 28 um but i think it's a position that we can't really afford to ignore very long i'm gonna look at this trade with atlanta again because that gets me pick 74 back and it's one that i would like to have i'm gonna go ahead and we're going to take that trade and see if we don't want to move around a little bit more as players are coming off the board. Uh, Xavier Worthy going to the Chiefs. Keeping an eye on the receivers here. Xavier Legat going to the Titans just before the Bills, which is quite upsetting. Um, but another guy that I really like is sitting here for the Bills, and that would be Led McConkey. He has not been around in a draft that I've done yet today, and that's going to be a pretty easy pick for me. I think he has crazy footwork. I think he... There's a lot of talk about him being like a slot only kind of guy. I don't see it. He looks like he can do everything to me. Um, that's going to be the pick for me here. And then pretty much in any trade down scenario that I'm running myself through, it's with the idea that we're going to be taking another receiver regardless of what order you do it here. I'd never trade with the Jets on draft day. Um, so it, it, it's with the idea in mind that I'm going to do the double dip at receiver. Um, whether that's, you know, the first pick in the second round and then coming back with a fourth round pick, um, whether that's getting into the third round, however it wants to shake out. Um, my idea there is getting two talented receivers, pairing them with what we already have in Shakir, um, Kincaid, Cook, um, Curtis Samuel, and kind of having that cost control for the future years and being able to add to that room down the road. Um, so the second pick we here we have, pick 60. I'm going to look at the defensive tackles and the edge groups. Like I said, those are two spots that I think fall off pretty quickly. And you can see here at the edge, we we already are kind of in that same spot. And there's not really anybody that gets me going there. Um, defensive tackle. At this pick 60 range, it's really Chris Jenkins or Braden Fisk for me. Um, I know it, there's a lot of people out there that love Tavondre Sweat. Um I was one of them of let's get this super athletic, huge human in here and, you know, see what we can do with him. Just had, I believe it was a DUI arrest. And for me, that happening, 
three weeks before the draft, damn near takes him right off the board for me. Um, not for me personally, but for what I expect the Bills to do and how much they're worried about culture and locker room fits and all that. I just don't see that as a move that they would be making. So we're going to go Chris Jenkins here. And then we have the third round pick that we got in the trade back scenario. Um, it's pick 74. And for me, the biggest needs on this team are going to be wide receiver, um, the defensive line, whether it's edge or defensive tackle, and then the safety room. Um, take a quick peek at safety here, but I believe the two that I would be interested in early and um, a lot a lot of people would have going early would be um, Newbin and then Cam Kitchens with the ties to Buffalo um, is a popular name. They're both already gone. This is a position that I'm not super interested in attacking early in the draft. Um, some names still out there. Malik Mustafa, Jaden Hicks, Dadrian Taylor, uh, Demerson, Javon Bullard. These are all names that are like the high end of the safety room. If we were to take one a little bit earlier, this would be about the position. I've watched McDermott and Bobby Babich work with safeties and take late round picks and cast offs from other teams and make them really impactful players. Um, we also have, in my opinion, at the very least, like the stopgap starters, however that shakes out. Um, so safety is a position that I'm super comfortable taking like round four, five, six and being able to develop into a starter. Um, so for me in this scenario, this is where I, I, I'd be looking to hit the double dip on the receiver. Um, taking a look at who we have here. I don't know how Javon Baker is sitting at 144. Um, I've done a bunch of different simulators that have him like top, top of the second round. I'm not going to really sit here and care about the fact that he's listed at 144 and I'm going to lock that in as a pick um puts the Bills offense going into next season with you know the existing players that we have already in Khalil Shakir uh Curtis Samuel throwing Dalton Kincaid in there um James Cook and then just adding being able to add Javon Baker, being able to add Ladd McConkey, I think that makes for a very formidable receiver room for not just this year, but kind of going forward. Um, yeah, those are some of the scenarios that we've run through here. Um, of all weeks that we'd love to have your feedback, drop a comment on this video. Um, give me your mock drafts and, and, in the comments section. Um, let me know where you think I'm horribly off base. Let me know what you liked, what you didn't like. Um, like I said, drop your drafts. Have a little bit of fun with it. Um, we're coming up. The draft is about 10 days away right now. Um, we're going to get one more episode in where I'm going to play with a few different mock draft scenarios again. And I think I'm going to end that episode with one longer draft. I'll probably go maybe four or five rounds. Um, as much as I love the draft and try to follow everything with the draft, I don't have the time or the knowledge base to give you anything of value into the seventh round. Um, I think NFL GMs have a hard enough time with that. Um, so we'll take a look at how we want to go through that. Um, but yeah, at least one more episode here where we're going to play around with some mock drafts and have some fun with it. We'll see if any other news comes out during this during that time period. Um, so make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you're not missing any episodes. Like, share, tell a friend about the podcast if you enjoy it. 
Um, and we will see you next week. As always, go Bills. Go Bills.